So I've been involved in mobile and social games for the last six years. Um, and I'll just go over a quick bit of history so you have some context as to how I see the world, which may be a little different than some of the other speakers that have been involved in games a lot longer than I have. So uh, this is my sixth company. Um, I started one of the very, very early blogging networks before the term blogs was even invented in the late 90s and uh, sold that company to another company called Jupiter Media. Subsequently, I was involved in another company called Bubble Share, which is a photo sharing service, which is where I learned the power of metrics and how important it is to design, not for subjective personal tastes and elegance, but for virality and for engagement and for true ROI using data. And because of the failures that I've had in Bubble Share, even though it did have a successful uh, return on investment outcome for me and my investors, I felt very strongly that I needed to learn more about how to use data in design. And so Bubble Share was really um, the first time I really appreciated what it meant to have great data to drive decisions in building a web service. Subsequent to that, I got involved with my co-founder and also my best friend from high school to start a company called Contagent. And Contagent is the leading enterprise analytics platform for games and mobile applications. We track billions and billions of events on a, on a monthly basis. Um, we have over 100 employees uh, across many, many different offices around the world. And we track our customers that range from very large publishers um, that include Yay, Ubisoft, PopCap, Perfect World, Shonda, Tencent, and Asia, to very, very small uh, upstart startups that's based in San Francisco. So I ran that for four years and had the opportunity to really think a lot about um, and talk to a lot of developers about how data is used uh, in games. And so after four years of doing that, um, I got, quite frankly, very, very burnt out and decided that I wanted to hand the reins over to my co-founder and take a little bit of a break. And in my break, I came across um, a meeting where I was speaking to one of my angel investors who became actually my new co-founder in my new company that I'm also simultaneously active in. So I'm still, Contagion is still running today. Um, it was funded by Facebook, it raised about $20 million, and it's currently uh, still is headquartered in San Francisco. I am, however, currently day-to-day uh, uh, -day active in a company called Big Viking Games. What Big Viking does um, is that we believe that the future of games uh, or much of the future of games will be very much A, data-driven, and B, be very seamlessly cross-platform and built likely, much of the future of games will be built in something like HTML5 or something that is on an open platform that allows you to be able to seamlessly play games across multiple platforms. And so my, my co-founder, Greg Thompson, um, just like as a way of background, he was... Uh, actually an angel investor in Contagion, which is how we met. He was also a pioneer in the Facebook platform where he created the first Ville game called Yoville, which is actually the predecessor to Farmville um, in terms of the name and when it came about. It was acquired by uh, Zynga very, very early on. And he also created the fish tank genre of games on Facebook, amongst many, many other things. His games have been, he's been launched over about 30, 40 different games and applications that have reached 40 million players around the world. So next slide, please. Um, so a little bit about Big Viking. Uh, again, we're based out of uh, Canada, uh, with two offices, one in Toronto, one two hours west of Toronto in a city called London, Ontario. Um, we focus on free-to-play games, mid-core uh, focus primarily, with some legacy games that are a little bit more casual. We're about 18 months old, so we grew very, very quickly all through profits, so we chose not to take outside investment money. And so we're profitable from day one. Um, we build most of our games in HTML5 with some legacy games in Flash. Um, and our titles include Fish World, Fish World Mobile. We built our first HTML5 experimental title. It's called Mech Force, which is a mech combat game, a robot combat game. Uh, Tiny Kingdoms is a RPG free-on-free -free battle game that is in currently alpha and dark heroes which is an experimental card 
collector card game that's also built in HTML5 that just rolled into uh, the App Store in beta as well. Next slide, please. So we, we make robot games. Um, so on the, on the topics that I was asked to, to talk about, um, one of the big ones was the role of data in live operations. I may not be able to go through everything, but I definitely want to go through one and, uh, and parts of two. Um, the reason why I think I was asked to speak about uh, data and live operations in games is because if, it feels like from what I've seen, there's an incredible amount of creative and artistic talent here in your country, but there seems to be a lack of um, uh, maturity and experience in building free-to-play games, which by the way is very, very commonplace pretty much everywhere outside of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and it's fortunate that, that I, I, I feel very fortunate that I've had the opportunity to spend many, many years in San Francisco to learn from many founders of very pioneering um, data-driven game design companies. And uh, so I'll be talking a lot about that and also HTML5. And also just as a case study, what we learned from MechForce uh, and, and our, our, that was our first HTML5 game. Next, please. So first I'll talk about live ops. Live ops is basically a term that we use for um, describing what happens when you ship a game and it's in, it's in the world, in the wilderness, and you're iterating and testing uh, some of the assumptions that you made in the game design process and how we use data in games. Next, please. So I believe that winning games is a combination of art and science where it's beyond now um, and it's much more about um, understanding uh, how data and live operations play into the programming and the art that you made assumptions around that you thought would resonate with players. Next. Now, some assumptions that I'm making here is that uh, the noise and clutter level is exponentially growing in the mobile and also Facebook ecosystems. There's more and more players going in. There's more and more competition that is more sophisticated than before. You look at the first, second generation of games in mobile, and a lot of them were very much experiments uh, in how to use a touch device, experiments in how to translate an existing game mechanic that worked in a potentially non-free-to-play world or the web world or console world and making it work in a touch device that is you know, a, a very, very different environment to, to getting it to free-to-play and making it such that it monetizes uh, in a way that makes sense uh, in the environment that it's it's living in, and then and and then these sophisticated peers that you're now competing with are progressively uh, becoming more data driven about how they develop and iterate their games. And lastly, the CPIs, as Joel mentioned, is increasing very very rapidly. Where we've seen in the last few years, um, your CPIs or cost per install in advertising has gone up multiple fold. So this is just a really rough way that, that we think about building games, is that 50% you know, of the battle happens after we ship the game. Um, and we very much believe in this concept of an MVP, which is the minimum, a term for minimum viable product, which Joel talked a lot about. And you know, we would argue that, that if you're not embarrassed by the game that you're shipping, on their first time out, you probably spent too much time polishing it or too much time uh, in your own cocoon uh, without getting live feedback. Now, I, I argue this especially for people that don't have a massively established brand. I mean, quite honestly, a lot of us, I think, have a certain ego about the quality bar that we want to hit before we ship a product because we feel like our names are attached to it, our friends are going to see it. But the reality is, without shipping a product that is embarrassing, you're not going to get great live feedback. And that's the only way you're going to get a very large volume of feedback without taking an iPad or an iPhone out to thousands of people and getting to play and tracking that data. And lastly, I want to mention that as you go through the cycle, these MVP alpha collecting data, this MDP cycle, where minimum desirable products, 
Um, and desirable is, again, very subjective. I, I would ship a game well before I feel like I'm truly proud of it just so I can get some early data. And I can iterate to ship 1.0 where at that point, I'm focused on getting the LTV to be up. Once, once I know the core mechanics are working, the core compulsion loops or the, 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 the mechanics that you're building into the game that makes it fun, then I would be looking at how do I increase the monetization? How do I get, how do you use the data that I'm capturing to build a better, mo better monetizing game? Next. So very quickly, I'll go through each part of this funnel that, um, this is a slide that I put together many years ago when um, I was trying to distill some of the learnings that I got from interviewing hundreds of the top game designers and co top game developers in the Facebook ecosystem many years ago. And it distilled it down to this ARM framework, which stands for Acquisition, Retention, and Monetization. And before anything happens, what you really got to understand is that these things don't, they, they all work in conjunction with each other to allow you to understand what your lifetime value is. And um, a lifetime value of a game, uh, unlike the console world, uh, is very much dependent on not just how well you're, you're engaging your audience, how well you're monetizing your audience uh, on an ongoing basis, but how much viral adoption slash viral sauce you have associated with your game. And that's why we often use the term social LTV or KLTV. K is just another way of uh, describing virality the, or the K factor as a way of measuring virality. Can you, next slide please. So the metrics that you want to focus on in the early game development, as in when you're just launching the game or when you're testing the game, is very different than the metrics that you should be looking at in, your, in, in the middle part and the late part. In the early part, as you're launching the game, you're obviously looking at sources of traffic, how different sources of traffic from different geographic region uh, plays out. Uh, are people playing your game more uh, in certain regions? Uh, maybe um, affinities to different types of games, affinity in terms of gender, um, and figuring out also, based on that traffic and those users, um, where are you getting virality? Where are you getting um, players to actually pass on your game, whether it's through word of mouth or engineered virality, where you're maximizing the number of outbound requests that are converting to live players that are engaging in your, in your game. And as you're moving into the mid-game development, you're obviously looking at things like engagement, and I'll talk a little, little bit about engagement metrics a little bit later. And also, at the, towards the end of game development cycle, you're looking at things like retention, where you know, long, short, medium, and long-term retention, and try to figure out what your LTV looks like. So next. So you'll see that it's a, it's a bit of a loop here, and I wanted to, to talk a little bit about this. The, um, at the top of the funnel, you have new users. So they come from either non-viral users or they're coming from viral sources. And viral sources tend to be either word of mouth or they are Facebook invites or they're uh, SMS invites. And at the top of the funnel, you want to segment each of those types of users because what you want to look at is um, what is your customer acquisition cost if you're paying for users from different channels? Um, how are you targeting those users? What kind of ad campaigns uh, and ad creatives are yielding the highest ROI? You may want to play with CPM ads, which is paying on display versus play paying on an install basis. You may want to target um, uh, different ad networks that are both incentivized or non-incentivized uh, ad networks. And as, as you're going through the funnel, you're retaining these users, you're monetizing these users, uh, this ultimately drives your, your, your LTV, which would then obviously affect how much on the CAC you are able to spend. So CAC is an acronym for customer acquisition costs. And the more you're able to drive retention, the more likely you're gonna be able to drive virality, and I'll, I'll get to that a little later as well. So, one way of measuring um, uh, or reducing acquisition costs is K-factor. Now, the virality of games inside of Facebook and mobile has, well, mobile has always been challenging, which is one of the reasons why I actually believe that there is now an, a, a new, new wave of opportunities to come back onto the web where a lot of people you know, kind of swung way too hard the other way, moving away from Facebook into mobile, and now, we have Facebook where 
they're much more aggressive and much more developer friendly than they were before. They actually answer your emails now. They actually want you to develop on their platform and they're providing you with new channels to uh, connect with your users and, and, and opening up more viral channels than they, they once had. Um, so while virality has become much more difficult, it is still possible and it's an important piece of reducing your customer acquisition costs. Next please. Um, the next piece is the retention uh, aspect of your game. So the things that we look for in retention is our day one, our day seven, or day one, day three, day seven, day 30, uh, and, and beyond retention. So the way that we look at retention, for those of you that, that don't understand how retention is calculated, day one retention is of those people that came in on day zero, meaning the day that they install, how many, what percentage of them came back on day one. And a metric that you should look for, and this ranges a lot. I could, you know, if you have a very hardcore strategy game, it's very different than if you have an infinite runner game, or a very different than you have an Angry Bird style game, where, you know, those sort of casual games are much more likely to have a much higher uh, day one retention. That could be north of 35, 45%. If you're in a more on the core market and you're not getting, you're not paying for great sources of traffic. Um, you could be looking at day one retention that are in the low teens or the low twenties. So it really depends on what type of game that you're currently working on. And day one retention is a really good number. Uh, it's an easy number to use to figure out if the changes in your first time user experience uh, is making a difference. Uh, you also want to look at day seven retention, which is obviously a little bit longer time frame. And just to the, the key thing here to understand is that Day seven means of the people that came back, sorry, of the people that came in and installed on day zero, how many of them came back on exactly day seven, okay? So that, that is a very important uh, number uh, and definition to understand because there's lots of different ways that you can look at day seven retention. And this is typically the way in which most of our peers look at day seven retention. And again, the same formula, same method is used for day 30. Um, and then uh, uh, the second, the, the, the number four, number five here are sessions per user and average session length. So these are looking at retention based on uh, how many sessions over the lifetime of the user to date are they uh, logging on and how frequently um, are they playing uh, the game um, and also how long uh, each session uh, 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 is like. And you, what, what we try to do is we try to cohort users or group users based on uh, different entry points. So entry, a, a cohort could be defined by um, sources of traffic or a cohort could be defined as um, a certain geographic region or, or a cohort could be people that installed greater than 30 days ago or greater than 90 days ago, how they uh, behave differently and try to understand how changes and iterations in your game that you're creating uh, are impacting various cohorts of those users. These are very important things to track because if you're not tracking them, you won't understand how people are actually behaving um, in different groups that you may want to uh, keep around and cater to. Now, the last, last number five is just average lifetime per user, which is, you know, at which point do those users tend to churn out based on different cohorts of users? Next, please. And then finally, monetization. Uh, the two key numbers that we looked at are average revenue per user and average revenue per paying user. And um, be careful when you're looking at these numbers because there, there is a, um, uh, there's, there's a change in, in the ARPU uh, or the ARP DAO, the average revenue per daily active user, as a game matures. And so if, you, if you're just gonna look at the entire user base and you spent um, a bunch of money at the beginning uh, with a, a certain type of user and then as later on you may have you know, spent um, a lot less money on, on a different group of users, each of those groups of users will have different ARPUs. And so if you're looking at just ARPU across the board, you're gonna have a, a very noisy set of data to, to be making decisions off of. So it's very important that you segment your users uh, when you're looking at numbers like ARPU and, and ARPUPU. Um, and then finally, percentage of paying users, uh, a very key number, you know, trying to understand what percentage of users are actually paying, 
will help you figure out you know, w how well you're doing, but also segmenting them down again, against uh, different cohorts and different groups is gonna be very important. So, so in, in um, uh, as a final sort of uh, overview, uh, again, as you are looking at different stages of the game, as you're entering into different stages of the game, you should be looking at different types of metrics and always be thinking about your metrics from on a cohort basis, especially if you're gonna be spending money or effort in acquiring new users from different groups. So the next piece I'll be talking about is uh, HTML5, um, and I'll try to fly through this quickly. So games everywhere and instantly is sort of the vision for HTML5 games. Next, Instant updates, being able to just uh, on, a, uh, on, a f on the fly uh, create a new button, create a new mission, create an entirely new game uh, mechanic and have it instantly updated across multiple platforms without a, a, a patched update through the App Store where you have you know, a one or two week review uh, period was the primary driver. Because if you're not iterating quickly, if you're not updating quickly, um, or you don't have the ability to update quickly, all the data in the world is not gonna matter. You can have great insights, but if you can't update quickly and test quickly, you can't, you can't take advantage of the data that you have. Playing everywhere and anywhere, being able to you know, go from playing on the phone, on the bus, and then as you get to work and you're sitting down at your PC, continue playing on your PC and Facebook. That is the vision of HTML5. That is something that we're building towards. Next, please. Synced across all platforms. So it's not just about being able to have um, a, a Flash version and an Objective-C version on mobile. Um, but being able to have the exact same experience across multiple platforms. And that means that you know, if I change the UI in my web version, it's instantly updated on my mobile version and vice versa. And that's super important if you're building a mid-core game where you don't want to give a, a particular uh, audience a, a d advantage or a disadvantage because you're not able to keep the updates in sync. So instantly play is something else that's really important. Uh, and I believe it's the future of, of a lot of games uh, in the free-to-play world, being able to not just, um, not just lower the friction by making the games free, but also being able to play them instantly anywhere um, without a download. Next. So you might be thinking, well, there's other cross-platform technologies out there that you could use. Uh, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with many of them. Air, well, Flash, Unity. And game closure, um, which is more of a, uh, uh, an extension of HTML5. Um, so I'll go through Air. So Air, Air is, has gotten a lot better, but it still has uh, uh, many development issues. Um, uh, one of the biggest challenges with using Flash and Air today is that Adobe's clearly shown that they're not fully committed to the platform. Um, Flash is something that I think is a great solution for building a game today. But if you're looking at you know, building for something in the future, I think there are better platforms to invest in. Um, it's still very much very powerful, a uh, mature tool set for the web. On the mobile, you'll find that the performance uh, is still not where uh, it could be uh, compared to a, a native game. But again, you have the advantage of being cross-platform. That said, you can't dynamically update on iOS. That, you know, doing, this is something that is very, very important to us because it allows us to use our data to make our games better more quickly without a, 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 an update lag. Unity, great for 3D. The 2D is not as mature. The 2D, however, has gotten a lot better with their most recent update. Um, if you want it to be seamlessly available on the web, which again, mobile, while it's huge, there's still many, many users that are on PCs playing games. So on the web, it's not quite as good because you do still have to download a plugin. Um, again, you can't update dynamically in real time. There is a hybrid solutions, or hybrid solutions out there. Uh, one of them is called Game Closure, and the other one's called Ludi, that basically take your HTML5 games uh, which are essentially JavaScript-powered games, compiles it down to a native, uh, uh, basically native code that then displays the graphics in, uh, in OpenGL. And that 
has the advantage of being able to take a JavaScript game or an HTML5 game and make it very high performance, um, which is the biggest challenge with HTML5 is graphical performance, but it doesn't have the ability to have that playable uh, in a mobile web browser, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that next. So there's a massive disruption in the way games are being distributed. We've gone from physical shelves to digital delivery with things like Steam to moving to social and mobile where you, know, you don't like, like Steam, you don't really have shelf space and where development cycles are a lot shorter, you can iterate quickly, and um, where you are looking at ways in which uh, you're hoping to reduce your customer costs, uh, acquisition costs, by making things uh, more viral. So next, please. And so social distribution today is um, currently the way that you would discover a game on, say, your Facebook application on um, your mobile device would be you get a notification from your friend, next. Then you, you get taken to the App Store because Joe said, go come play with me on this PvP game. So then I click on it, I get taken to the Apple App Store, then I get to install the game, then I wait for it to download, then it gets into this giant list of games that I've downloaded in the past and never got to because I was waiting for it on the bus, and when I got off the bus, I had to go and do something else, and it's just sitting there in my pocket. And next, um, and as I'm loading it, uh, and I finally get around to playing the game, maybe many hours or days later, I now have to patch it because it's, you know, it's gone through a couple of patches since I, start, I first got it. And then I'm loading it, and now I'm waiting for it to load, and finally, I'm playing. So now, the problem with this is that when I got that invite from Joe, that was like four days ago, you know, three patches ago, and I was on a bus. And now, you know, it's in my phone, and I finally get around to it, and Joe's already playing another game. Um, and he was really, he, what he really wanted to do was he wanted me to have a PvP match with him, or maybe join up for a co-op game. And obviously, that's not going to work when there's so much friction between me playing with him in a social network on a mobile device. So, next. So, what are the things, you could just flip through this really fast. So there's, there's this massive process. You just keep moving forward, 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 stop. OK. So there's, this, there's a thousand different steps between getting the invitation to you know, going, going and playing the game. And then maybe when you're playing the game, you may, be, you may be looking at the invite, and you might be on Facebook, and the Facebook thing it reminded you, the Facebook invite reminded you of this game that you're supposed to play with Joe, or that you wanted to play with Joe, and you're on the PC and you don't have a PC version, which really suck. But the nice thing about HTML5 is you can get the invite, you can play anywhere, and you can play instantly. So in theory, you can play instantly. There's still a number of challenges, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Next. So I'll talk about this in the context of a mech force, and I'll talk a little bit about this uh, uh, in the end and, and the lessons learned. So next. So what we wanted, high-level goals that we wanted, we want a native-like experience on mobile. So I want, we wanted this HTML5 game that could play in a mobile browser and also a desktop browser to look exactly like a game that you would get uh, in a native App Store environment. And our games, by the way, is shipped inside of this thing called PhoneGap, which is essentially um, allows us to ship an HTML5 game inside the App Store um, as a way in which we can get additional distribution beyond being it, having it playable on the, on, the face, on the desktop web and the mobile web. We want to play playable in any modern mobile browser um, and also seamlessly across platforms. Next. So what we wanted to build was a native experience. Next. And so not native experience and not a website that's been jammed into a game. Now, I, I absolutely respect the, the, the games that have been built here because they've been incredibly successful, but we felt very strongly that we need to evolve beyond the idea of having a scrollable page of HTML5 uh, in, you know, jammed inside of a, a, a iOS wrapper. Next. And we want to make something that was more like this, where you have isometric views of games. You have, uh, you have the ability to play a game that didn't require you to scroll up and down a menu, menu page. Next. And so we made this. 
Um, this took us 12 months, uh, and in, 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 I would say that the, in the 12 months with dozens of people involved, uh, we learned a lot, we failed even more, and, uh, but the, the good news for us anyways was that we were able to uh, really appreciate and understand and create uh, a very powerful engine from the experiment that we have with MechForce, which again is a game that involves robots that were procedurally generated on the client um, and with you know, millions of different combinations of uh, heads, arms, weapons, and, and legs. Um, with an isometric view that is all done in HTML5. And so there's two things that, that uh, are very important to understand with HTML5. There is desktop browser HTML5, and there is mobile HTML5. Uh, mobile HTML5 is a lot more challenging to make responsive. Uh, in fact, I would argue it takes four to 10 times longer to build something in HTML5 from scratch than it does to build something uh, in Unity or Flash and it would be half as fast. Uh, so it's brutally inefficient and expensive, but there are obviously significant advantages and we had to break down a lot of barriers to get something to play like this in, in an environment where it's somewhat responsive. And going back to what I mean by desktop and mobile, desktop HTML5 is relatively easy to make responsive because you have the ability to tap into a very powerful CPU. On a mobile device, however, these things are a lot slower. Um, the browsers are a lot slower, the CPUs in these things are a lot slower, so you have to do a lot more uh, optimization, which is why things take four to 10 times as long to build. Next, please. So we have missions in the game, next. We have, um, we have the game simultaneously working uh, on a, a mobile device as we do in Facebook. So anytime it change any of the buildings, the game mechanics, the, the, the buttons on, one, on, on the mobile device, it instantly gets reflected in the uh, desktop. And why is this important beyond the fact that it makes for a better player experience? It also happens to be good business. Um, being able, to, we've seen a lot of data from appears that show that if you have a game that uh, exists both on mobile and also on a desktop PC, the, uh, the revenue per user is significantly higher. And this is especially important when you're looking to build a game for a mid-core audience. Next, please. So now we're working on something totally different on the engine that we've built over the last 12 or 18 months called Tiny Kingdoms. Um, it's a game that uh, should be rolling out uh, in the next uh, quarter, so hopefully you guys will be able to check this out. And so I'll just wrap up with a couple of things about HTML5 challenges. And so on the one hand, you might think, why are you building uh, HTML5 games when it's so much more expensive and so painful um, when, when the performance is literally, you know, uh, when you work 10 times more than native, you get half the performance. And this discovery is really crappy because uh, ultimately you have to ship it on an I.O. Uh, like in the App Store uh, and you're not really getting any real benefits behind uh, that. Uh, and if you were to make it so that it's available on the mobile web, there's no um, you know, icon that gets downloaded. And in payments, there's no common payment system uh, that makes it easy like iTunes or the, the Google Play Store that allows you to do one-click purchase. Why? Will we do this? I'll get to that. It's not just because I'm insane and crazy. Um, so challenges and trends. So performance we talked about. The, the, the are, there are good news. There is good news to HTML5. Um, we're, getting, we're finding that the second generation of tools that we're building for ourselves, we're able to do things in half or a quarter of the time, which means that it still only takes four times longer. But, but it's still better. Uh, and, and it only took us a year to cut the, the time by you know, a half or less. Um, discovery is an issue uh, if you're shipping outside the App Store, um, but you know, PhoneGap, which is the, the packaging technology that we use to ship in the App Store, uh, is a stepping stone for us, and um, it, it's also you know, building for mobile first, uh, with HTML5 allows us to have a free version for the web that you can put in Congregate or you can put on Facebook. Um, 
And rediscovery is an issue of at home icon, but Facebook is definitely helping us with that with having, you know, the ability to have notifications show up inside of Facebook. And, uh, and with the payments, while there's no standard payments right now, we believe this is going to change. We believe that eventually Facebook will allow you to make payments on mobile devices they already have, but not inside of games right now. They already are allowing for mobile payments with Facebook credits um, in a mobile device for e-commerce transactions. This is only a matter of time before we, we, we see, I believe, Facebook allowing for payments uh, in the open web uh, on a mobile device. Next. So the pros and cons. The pros are, there's a bunch of pros. Let's just go through, just click a couple more times. Let's stop right there. So um, these, HTML5 is actually incredibly good for menu-driven games. Um, there's a, you have a single code base that allows you to be cross-platform. One of the biggest challenges, I'll give you an example. Uh, Kingdoms of Camelot with Kabam is obviously a very successful Facebook game. Start off as a Facebook game. I had a, a great audience, but they had a very difficult time carrying that audience over to mobile because they had a difficult time making sure that the mobile version kept in sync with their Facebook version, and they ultimately made the decision to make it two separate games. Um, had HTML5 been mature enough for them and available to them, they wouldn't have had to do that. They could have had a synchronized uh, code base that allowed them to be cross-platform very very conveniently. Real-time updates across all platforms is huge. Um, we are building technology that allows us to deploy very quickly on uh, uh, Windows phone devices and Android uh, and BlackBerry. Um, you can very, very quickly do A-B testing with HTML5. So being aggressively testing things uh, is a lot easier when you're using HTML5 that allows you to do real-time updates. Um, and then you know the idea that eventually and this is the ultimate goal, and, and this is the reason why we've invested in HTML5 and why, why I want people to um, see where the, the world may be going. Uh, we believe it's going towards this direction of being able to play games uh, and discover games in the open web, um, and meaning open web on mobile. So being able to click on a link, you getting a link in, in your inbox, clicking a URL, and whether you're on PC or your, your TV or your mobile device, and you'll be able to load up a browser and immediately play without having to download a game with your friends. So the cons are, I think we've talked a lot about this already, it takes forever to build anything, your animations are gonna suck, and um, there's one more, I think. And, oh yeah, you have, must have really amazing and st stupidly expensive developers. Um, and, oh yeah, the tools are gonna suck because you're gonna have to build your own. But that's all changing. Well, it's, the strong developers are not gonna change, they're always gonna be expensive. But, but the other ones will change. So lessons learned. A wrap up of a few lessons learned here. The next, uh, holy shit, MechForce was probably like the worst project and experiment one could possibly create as a first time title for a new company. So we took massive technology risks by building HTML5. We took massive team risks by scaling from a team of four to 40 people in less than a year. Um, and we took massive design risks by having a massive scope with very sophisticated, procedurally generated content. Um, so I think of games as having these three buckets. Uh, and if you're going to do it, if you're going to make a game, just pick one of those risks. Don't, don't pick all three like we did. Um, so final takeaways. Uh, low cost of development. Just keep this in mind. You, it's, it's, it's okay to not be in the top 25. You can still make money not being in the top 25. And this is super important because I talk to developers all the time and everyone's like, oh, we're only gonna be successful if we're in the top 25. Yes, you are gonna be incredibly successful if you're in the top 25 of whatever you know, platform you happen to be. Um, but if your cost of development is low, and Toronto, in some, because of the government support that we have and the tax subsidies that we have, we have costs that almost are competitive to the cost of development here in Colombia. Um, so we've taken advantage of that as a part of our strategy to keep um, uh, our costs relatively low and execute against games that we feel could 
be in the top 50 or even the top 100, knowing that even if it hits the top 50 or 100, we will be return on investment positive or will be ROI positive. We'll still make money off games even if they're only in the top 100. And especially if you're going to be cross-platform and you're building with cross-platform in mind and cross across large amounts of geography. And the other thing is that, to keep in mind is that while this is an incredibly important formula, average revenue per user has to be greater than your cost per install. If you're not paying a lot for install um, and you're not looking at large volumes of CPI, your cost per install becomes a lot lower. It's only when you try to cram massive amounts of users into your game in a very short period of time does the CPI dollar amount go up. But if you have a modest, if you're looking at a modest trickle of users coming in, the CPIs can be a lot lower. Um, and and why, why, you might think, well, why, why are the people willing to pay so much for CPI in a, such a short period of time? Why are they jamming thousands and thousands of users into the games per hour? The reason why is that they're trying to get up in the app store so that they're in the top grossing or top downloads list. And you don't necessarily need to have that cost structure in order to be successful. Um, lower cost of reuse and technology and templates is super important. Another way of reducing and lowering your costs of production is being smart about using templates of success that you've built. So reskinning games that you've already made, reusing technology that you already have so that you can ship games faster and experiment faster and get feedback faster. Be clever about traffic. So you can trade traffic with other people work with publishers, like Joel mentioned, we can go and um, work with peers that, uh, that may have a high affinity uh, in terms of audiences to your games that, that where they have lower LTV than you have that may be willing to pass on users to you um, for a relatively low cost. And then also arbitrage and take advantage of nascent platforms that aren't as competitive. Get your games onto a Windows phone. Get your games on a, uh, a BlackBerry. Get your games on all these other platforms that are not super cluttered, that have ecosystem and platform partners that are willing to promote your game, profile your game for free because they are desperate for games on their platforms. And finally, um, uh, free to play is not just um, about building a game and shipping it. I advise most of uh, uh, my, my customers, one of my, my contagion days, my friends, to save 50% of their budget on iteration. So spend half your money on building the, what you think is a good game, and then spend the other half of your budget on what will actually make it a good game in the eyes of your players. And that's super, super important. And lastly, use data and always be testing, always be testing. A, B, test everything that you think you can come up with that would make a difference in the game and track that data. Uh, oh, I do have one more point. That wasn't the final point, sorry. So MVP plus data plus fast iteration equals winning formula. This is what we believe. This is the philosophy of a company and it's a philosophy of many very successful small game developers especially um, because they don't have a necessarily a brand to protect and they are able and willing to take some risks by throwing a game out there that may be embarrassing um, but they're able to capture lots of data and they're very aggressive about investing in systems that allow them to capture this data and iterate very quickly. Um, and I think that's it. Last slide. So call me. Um, we, are, we are hiring artists. Uh, we have a fantastic company. We are working with remote people and also we're looking to hire people in our Toronto uh, and London, Ontario office. We offer free breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We, you know, we, have, we, we pay for overtime. We don't crunch. Um, and uh, we have uh, stock options and very competitive pay. So that's, that's the end of my advertising. Thank you very, very much.